and receiving. And our favorite scripture for sowing and reaping is 2 Corinthians chapter 9. He who sows sparingly shall reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. Now, he who sows sparingly, what does he mean? Or should I church? What does he mean? He who sows sparingly? It means little. <laughs> there we go. Doctor, there we go. We have to um, uh, rewire the church and unlearn so much garbage that we all have learned. I am not pointing accusing finger at anyone. We were taught it and we taught others because we didn't bother to check the book like the Berean Christians. I said, he who sows sparingly, he says, he who sows little. So if little offends God, how about the widow's might? To give sparingly is to go to the book of Malachi and understand what it says. If you have a clean animal that is not blind, that is not spotted, and you, you, you separate the clean ones and you take the blind one and you have spared the good ones and you have reserved the worst for God, that's what he's saying. How many of you want to reap where you do not bestow labor? John chapter 4. I didn't write this, <laughs> so you can't call me a false preacher, because I didn't write this book. God is the author. John, chapter number 4, verse number 35. Do you not say there are still four months, and then comes what? The harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes, and look where? At the fields, for they are already white for what? For harvest. And he who reaps, receives wages, and gathers fruit for eternal life. That both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Oh, no, but you are reaping. You want to reap where you bestow labor. That's why you are where you are. I don't think you got it. I've sent you to reap where you have bestowed no labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. I think you are ready now. Can I teach for a few minutes some truths that will change your life? I want to invite you, members of Abundant Life Church, into Abundant Life that God offers. And the qualification is you don't have money. Now, I'm not living here and telling you, uh, and say, he told us we must not give again. I didn't say that. When I told you, even in the Garden of Eden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil represents the tithe. You eat it, you die. You can look at it through our scriptures. But you are not given because you want to receive. You are given because you have become a kingdom financial pillar to sponsor the gospel. And it just happens that those who give will have more. It just happens that those who have less will continue to have less, and those who have much more will continue to have much more. But I'm saying you can come to God without money and he can bless you so well that you always give him the glory. That you will not be a self-made man. 
You know, men take pride. I am a self-made man. I went through life. I struggled. And now I have this. I got this out of the sweat of my brow. That's a curse. God hates sweat. Man was not sweating until he fell. The presence and the glory of God covered him. It was after he fell, he said, out of the sweat of your brow. Every time he said, this is my sweat, it's a curse. Brothers, do fishes go to swimming school? Huh? Have you seen them carrying their uh, swimwear and say, we are going to learn how to swim? <laughs> Doctor, does any... Elephant have to pray to be big. <laughs> they say, oh, Father, another baby elephant is coming. We are doing vigil tonight in the name of Jesus. This elephant coming will not be a rat. In Jesus' mighty name, he must be big. You are wasting your time. They are naturally big in their family. So why is your life full of struggle and your prayer full of sorrow? It's supposed to be communion with the Father. You're supposed to wake up and say, I thank you for freely. You have given me all things. I bless your holy name this day because by means of strength shall no man prevail. The race is not to the swift. The battle is not to the strong. It is the lamb that takes the prey in Zion. I thank you because when I'm weak, you are strong. Yeah. Yeah. Isaiah 55. Let's roll. Spend about an hour to knock off all the things we held so dear <laughs> that are not standing on truth or partial truth there. We want the whole truth that sets man free. Isaiah 55, are you there with me? Verse 1 to 4. He reads, and I quote, Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you will have no money. I love that because I knew how I got to Lagos. <laughs> you understand me? When I left home, my God, you don't even want to enter the vehicle I entered to get to Lagos. <laughs> you will have no money. Come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Does that make sense? Come and buy wine. Come and buy milk without money and without price. Come and buy. But you are buying without money and with, you are buying without price because it's all paid for. You do not qualify, but someone has qualified you. You know when you want to buy a mortgage, we want to buy a house, so you do not qualify for mortgage because your credit history is not good. And God says, I qualify you. Come and buy without money, without price. I'm going to give you houses you have not built, vineyards you have not planted, wells you have not dug. It's going to be all yours. I'm going to give it to you. But I don't want you to eat and be full and forget me. For I give you the power to get wealth. A lack of wealth is a lack of power. I give you power to get wealth to establish a covenant which I swore to your father. I didn't even swear it to you. I swore it to your father that you are the beneficiaries of it. Come by without money, without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul do what? The light itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The sure mercies of David. Indeed, I've given him as word, a witness to the people, a prototype, a model. Don't reinvent the wheel. Let me do for you what I did for David.
let your soul delight itself in abundance. What does it mean for one soul to delight itself in abundance? Let me first define the word delight. Can you see it in Isaiah 54, verse number 2? And let your soul delight itself in abundance. Say that with me. Let, let your soul delight itself, itself in abundance. In abundance. It simply means it's not natural for your soul to delight itself in abundance. It's not natural. It's not a natural thing. When darkness was upon the face of the deep, what did God say? Let there be light. It means darkness was ruling supreme. And God commanded the light to shine out of darkness. He said, let there be light. Something was holding light from manifesting and the word of command was given, let. And so when you hear, let your soul, it means it's not a natural thing. You have not, your soul has not been delighting itself in abundance. I didn't say you have not been desiring good things. <laughs> I didn't say you don't desire a good house. You don't desire to live in a good neighborhood. You understand? That does not mean you don't desire a good car. You do. And that does not, that's not what it means for your soul to delight itself in abundance. That's the exact opposite of what it means. And that's where the church has missed it for a very long time. All of us. We want to be rich so that our bills are paid, our needs are met, our children's school fees and colleges fees are paid, and we enjoy vacation from time to time, we go on a cruise, and we live the good life, suffering for Jesus. Now, all those things are free benefits. As beautiful as your car is, is a tool. When it stops being a tool, we become fools. It's a tool. It's a tool to take you from place to place. Your house as wonderful and glamorous as may look, and I'm not living in a ghetto. Do you understand me? It's a tool. It's a place to rest and relax so that you have all the resources to do the things God has destined you to do. But for your soul to delight is serving abundance means exactly different thing. Are you ready? Let's look at the word delight. Webster Dictionary, what does it mean? Delight. The word delight means to please very much, to please very much, or to take great pleasure in something. That's what Webster Dictionary says. Delight. It means to please very much or to take pleasure in something. The synonyms, that is other words like it, are agreeable, enjoyable, gratifying, inspiring, pleasant, and satisfactory. So when it says, your soul delights itself in abundance, it means there's something of God in it that seeks to please God in that desire, in that delight. There's something connecting to heaven. You want to please God. That's the reason for the request. Now, all this sowing and reaping, the Bible says it is mockery to God for you to reap without sowing. Say, God cannot be mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, the same he shall reap. Does that have to do with money, doctor? No. He who sows into the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, and he who sows into the spirit shall of the spirit reap eternal life. Guys, let's think straight. Everything you ever need was provided before you got to the planet. You just need to discover them. Look at the opposite of the word delight. 
because that's the situation of so many people, the reality of many people in the church. The opposite of the world, the light is depressing, mournful, offensive, painful, and wearisome. That describes the life of many people. So let's look in the Bible and see what the light in your soul in abundance, what it is not. Number one is not the wishful thinking of lazy bones. When you say, let your soul delight itself in abundance, it's not for a man who will lock up himself in the room and pray and fast and does not go out, does not do anything because he's moving heaven. You moving heaven? <laughs> you can't even move a truck. Can I ask you simple questions? Was Joseph rich in Egypt? Huh? Answer my question. It's not a setup. Was Joseph rich? What did he sow to become rich? Who did he give to? Joseph was in charge of all the treasure house of Egypt. The Egyptians were at his beck and call. When they came to Pharaoh and said, give us, God said, go to Joseph. Whatever he says to you, you do. At the mention of the name of Joseph, every knee must bow. It was the decree of the king. Which charismatic ministry did he send money to? <laughs> I'm just, be, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. If, if, if I'm doing something bad, forgive me. You know, you know, what, 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 he, he prayed and he sowed seed. Okay, let, Joseph is far away. Let's start with Isaac. And Isaac sowed in that year and reap a hundredfold. It was in the time of Famine. Oh, yes, I know you've read your Bible. I always trust you. I know the people of Abundant Life Church. I've been here for a long time. Old and new faces. I know you here. I know the spirit in the house. You've read your Bible. And there was a famine in the land beside the famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac was getting ready to go to Gerah. And God said, don't go down to Egypt. Sojourn in this land and I will bless you. Right? And Isaac sowed in that year and reaped a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. And the man went forward. And the man grew. He became exceedingly great. And he had possession of flocks and possession of and men servants and women servants. And he became so exceedingly rich that the Philistines envied him. Question, what did he sow? He sowed in that land and he reaped servants. So he must have buried some servants in the ground to reap them. We just, we just make a mumbo jumbo of all these things. No clarity, so no power. Because clarity is power. Lazy drones are mediocre. Hide under the guise of religion. They don't obey God. They don't obey leaders. They just think something will drop from heaven and they will have breakthrough. I can guarantee what you have is breakdown. Because the lazy man will put his hand in his bowl and it will weary him to even bring it up to feed himself. Good food is being given here every time, but you don't want to follow instructions. No, you are a daydreamer. That's not what it means for your soul to delight itself in abundance. Do you know what the Bible talks about daydreamers? Well, let me show you to you in Isaiah. Are you ready? Isaiah chapter 29. 
Isaiah 29. <laughs> I'm sorry that I'm laughing. <laughs> I just remember one of my daughters in the faith. <laughs> this, this man came to him, came to her and said, I had a dream last night and God told me you're my wife in that dream. He said, when you wake up, let me know. <laughs> because you're, you're still dreaming. <laughs> when you wake up, let me know. <laughs> You are still dreaming. God told you he didn't tell me. <laughs> and the report was brought to me that she's so arrogant. I said, no, she's not arrogant. She's just telling you, wake up. Because the best dreams come to pass when you are awake. Wake up. Can you afford her? He said, I believe God. I said, oh, she went to school. She's industrious. She made it up to the top. And you said, God just spoke to you in a dream last night. You have no job, no address, there's no place you are working, and you want her? No, you want to waste her. Go get yourself a job first. Can God ask a rich woman to marry a poor man? Yes, he can. But let him be God. And let it not be desperation. Let it be God. Doctor, is it not amazing that before God thought of giving Adam a wife, he first gave him a residence in the garden. <laughs> so he had an address. It's called the Garden of Eden. And then he gave him work to do. And so he had residence and he had <laughs> work. And then the Lord said, it's not good for him to be alone. Honestly, if he has no house, no job, no future, it is better for him to be alone. <laughs> because he's going to increase misery in the world and give birth to children he cannot raise. Isaiah 29. Verse number 7. The multitude of all the nations will fight against Ariel, that's Jerusalem. Even all who fight against her and her fortress and distress her shall be as what? A dream of a night vision. Hello. It shall be what? A dream of a night vision. Is it a vision or is it a dream? <laughs> it shall be as a dream of a night vision. It shall even be as when a hungry man dreams and looks, he eats. But he awakes and his soul is still empty. Or as when a thirsty man dreams, and look, he drinks. But he awakes and indeed is faint. Have you dreamt before that you are picking money everywhere? <laughs> if you dream about picking money in your dream, and you wake up and there's no money, welcome to the world of reality. If you drink you are eating, you dream that you are eating and you are hungry, God is telling you something is not adding up. Do you understand me? But letting your soul delight in abundance is not daydreaming. It's not wishful thinking. What exactly is it? I'll tell you my story. And then I'll round up with David so you can go home. In 1984, my wife and I stepped into a church premises for the first time that particular church. We've been part of Deeper Life Christian Ministry. Until that time, I'd never heard the preacher that day preach. It was my photographer who invited us to this church because I became tired of church politics and, and religion within the church. And so we went to this church, and it was first Sunday of March, 1984. The man wore a gray suit and a white shirt. It looked okay, but... I just wanted to hear what he had to say. He preached on the mercy of God. I enjoyed the preaching. We finished and I told my wife, then we were still dating. Why not caught us? Let's go home. But the man announced and said, we want all children of God to wait. And I said, let's go home. My wife said, are you not a child of God? I said, I understand their language. This is Christianese. When they say children of God, they mean they are members. Hello. 
don't you think the same way? You believe Christians have a corner on God when it comes to faith. And we are people of faith and the others don't have faith. Every time Jesus said, no, I've never seen such great faith. No, not in Israel. He's a Gentile. You don't even know that sowing and reaping is Genesis. It's not Christian. It's not for Christians. It's for humanity. There's a higher order. So my wife said, you're a child of God too. So I waited. And the man said, when others have gone, thank you for waiting. We need professionals who can help us. They just got their camp. They wanted to start building. We need professionals who can help us. And we need uh, electricians, engineers, Builders, I was none of those. I'm a trained lawyer. So the man stood there and he pointed at me my first day in their church. That brother in white, blue, white. That was the vest, the, the t-shirt I was wearing it was white, blue, white. I looked down, I looked up. He said, yes, you. I said, yes. He said, what's your profession? I said, I'm a lawyer. The whole church, ha, 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 You're a lawyer. Please see me in my office today. It was my first time. <laughs> this woman caused trouble for me by asking me to wait behind. <laughs> it was a good trouble. I went to see him that day, and he said, we have these cases. Can you help us? I didn't want to be part of their church. I just came to worship. That's how they dragged me in. About the August of that year, it was their annual convention. I'd gone through baptismal service a second time because they said you must be baptized by their church for you to be part of their church. And they said the baptism I had in the Baptist church is not correct because it was in a baptistry, not a flowing river. Ha <laughs> ha! Here comes religion, we are in white. But I followed, and it was this time of the convention. Are you listening to me? For more than three Sundays, the man stood behind the pulpit and telling everybody, as God provides for you, the total budget for the convention this year is 100,000 naira. And 100,000 naira <sighs> kept on announcing. I'm trying to figure out how much that will be today. It will be about $100,000 back then too. Because one naira was one dollar eight cents in those days. That naira was stronger than dollar once upon a time. You don't know that. He kept on announcing, but the whole church could not put the money together. And by the third or fourth announcement, I became angry. And I wrote him a letter. I said, I'm tired of your announcements. Tell God to bless me and this nonsense will stop. Trained lawyer, my salary per month was six, seven hundred and ten naira. Seven hundred and ten, less than a thousand naira. The budget, hundred thousand naira. I got angry that all of us could not do that at once, and the announcement continued and continued until I was irritated in my spirit. But it was the spirit of giving. That was rising on the inside of me, rejecting that announcement that it should stop. The man received my letter, did not respond to me. And two months to my wedding, September 24, 1984, they were to give me my car loan that morning. I stepped into the office and they fired me. You don't get it. Two months to my wedding, I got married November 24, 
1984. This was September 24, 1984. Exactly 10 years that I got born again. They fired me at work. It was a Monday. I went to church in the evening and I showed the letter to my pastor. And he started laughing. He said, <laughs> at last God sent you a reply. I said, sir, God sent me a reply. He said, yes, you wrote to me that if God will bless you, I will stop all the useless announcement I was making. You have gotten the reply. I said, sir, the reply is to fire me? He said, yes. How much do you earn a month? Less than a thousand. I said, yes. How many years would you have to save to be able to afford a hundred thousand? He said, go and start your own practice. I said, sir, something is not adding up. You don't get it. God does not get it. Because if you get it, there's a private practice decree, a law, that says a lawyer cannot start practicing on his own except he has been five years at the bar. And I'm not yet five years. I was called 1981. This is 1984. You want to throw me into prison? He said, well, I don't know. But that's the reply. So I went back home and prayed to God. And God said, start your own chambers. Now I knew God was, has lost touch with the earth completely. <laughs> I mean, honestly, he has completely lost touch with the earth. He's in heaven. He's so far away. He does not know what is happening to people like me. I've just been fired. My wife came home to look for me that day. Every afternoon we go for lunch together. I didn't go to her office. What do you tell a woman? Two months to your wedding that they have fired you? When she came home and saw me that I said, what happened? You didn't come for I said, yeah, I didn't come for lunch, yes. I said, is everything? I said, everything is all right. I'm trying to find my feet. I couldn't even announce to her that I've been fired. But I listened to God, and I went to print letter-headed paper. And that's why I've been messing around with you, saying, hell shall I, hell shall I. I told God, I said, you know what? This is the deal. I'm going to name the chambers after you. It will be called Ashadai Chambers because it's going to fail. And I'll let the whole world know that you led me to start something that is about to fail. So I'll put your name there. El Shaddai Chambers. <laughs> I fixed the date for commencement, October 1, 1984. The same president now. The same Muhammad Buhari was a former military head of state. On October 1, he came on national television. Fellow countrymen and women, private practice decree abrogated. They canceled the decree. That's how I started, sir. Mm. Do you understand me? Do you know the first fee I got from the next job I got? After I was fired, I earned three and a half years my annual salary in one brief. The car I was meant to buy was a Passat TS. I was to borrow money to buy it, but I bought that car. Gosh. It was, and I drove, the, not the Santana, not the, G, not the Passat, no, the top ring, Santana GX. And I drove it to the chambers where I was fired. I said, come and bless my car for me. I got married without borrowing a dime, started my own chambers, and heavens just opened, and things began to come like a flood. Are you listening to me? I've not finished. I'm going to the second one. I had a postal, she can testify, behind my office in those days. You know what's written on the simple postal? I am a millionaire. The word of God makes me one. I'd never seen a million in my life. And one day God arrested me. He said, you know, I can make you a millionaire. I said, you do, and I'll give it to you. And in 1985, the first million came. It was the most difficult million to give. 
because God ensured it was exactly one million. There was nothing on top. It was a first, and I'm not sure there will be any other. So I called photographer. I put the check in my jacket. I said, take my photograph. So at least I'll be remembering that once upon a time, I held a million check, and I carried everything, gave it to the church. My external auditor came and said, you are crazy. They are manipulating you in the church. No, nobody was manipulating me. It's a deal between God and I. And that's how heavens open over me. That's what it means for your soul to delight itself in abundance. My soul did not delight itself in abundance because I wanted to build a house. I wanted to marry. I wanted to buy a car. I said, I'm tired of that announcement. For as long as there is a need in the house of God, I want to be among those who respond to it so that there is no announcement whatsoever. That was what David did. That's why he said, I have made him a model for you. Read Isaiah 55 again. I want to show you so that you understand this and you stop struggling. Stop struggling. Don't let anyone exclude you from the abundance that God has in store for you. The only condition is that your soul must delight itself in abundance. Isaiah 55. In verse number 3, in verse number 2, he said, Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. And what? And let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. Indeed, I've given him as what? As a witness to the people, a leader and commander for their people. Let's look at the life of David for a moment and see how this man became who he became. Twice, last night I told you, David begged bread. Didn't I show you last night? Were you here last night? Twice in his life, he begged bread. He begged from a priest. He begged from Nabal. Do you understand me? So he started as a beggar. And he wrote about it. He said, I've been young. Now I am old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed, beg bread. He was telling the truth because he begged. But he begged so that his seed would not beg. Was he forsaken? No. While he was begging, he was not forsaken. But that was the starting point to show that you even much more qualify. Because if God could raise a beggar from the dunghill and a poor from the doors, and will set them among the princes, then the princes ought to know that America is not just designed for the likes of Donald Trump alone. I'm not Democrat. I'm not Republican. I just, I'm telling you I hate arrogance. God hates it too. If you hang around some people, they will belittle you. You think you have no chance. But David had no chance of survival. I mean, doctor, Samuel came to the house of Jesse. Jesse paraded seven children, did not call David, because in his mind, David did not qualify. Is the least? Is the last? Do you understand? Samuel had to stand and say, Are these all the children? <laughs> There's still one more, but it's with the sheep. It doesn't feed into royalty. And God raised that one to become king of Israel, and you say you have no hope? Not only did he beg bread, he became extremely vulnerable. He had to pretend to be a madman. Throwing saliva on his own beard and acting like...